He might. Uh, he might. How's this? Can you hear that okay? It's coming through on the sound. This is not very loud in this room. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Brad Cook, president of Snow College, and it is really my distinct honor and privilege to welcome to another entrepreneurship seminar. And I'm very, very uh, pleased with our guest today. Uh, he's not only a, a dear friend and someone I admire very deeply, but as someone who's very, very committed to higher education. Uh, he's currently, uh, Rich Christensen is currently the board of trustees chairman at Southern Utah University, which is where I got to know him. But he's a really interesting person, and I think if you listen very carefully, there's a lot to learn from him. Uh, this is a guy who started um, 51 businesses, 16 of which have, have made um, our multi-million dollar enterprises. Um, he's an author of two books. Um, he is a lecturer, a mentor, he had one of his greatest uh, assets is, is uh, mentoring young entrepreneurs in, uh, in, in, in creating successful propositions. But he's a, just a terrific human being. He's a philanthropist. He's very committed to education, but also education for developing countries. So he spends a lot of time um, overseas finding ways in which he can lift and help uh, there. He's also a father. Uh, five sons and one daughter who uh, the daughter comes from Nepal and uh, so I want to give him as much time uh, as we can 
But listen carefully. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot here. And uh, thank you so much, Rich, for coming down, spending time with us. Uh, with a very busy schedule. And uh, again, Rich Christensen. Thanks for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. I do have a special affinity for Snow College on multiple levels. First of all, I consider your president an amazing man, dear friend, and anytime Brad Cook asks me to do something, I'm in. So I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, second of all, my little uh, Sherpa daughter, Nawang, graduated from Snow College. And so I have a special affinity for Snow College for that reason. And a couple of my Sherpa kids that I've kind of raised, this is where we send them. It's a great institution and really thrilled to be here. Uh, as I thought about what I might be able to say today, uh, I, I wanted to start by maybe telling a little bit of my story. I did have a couple of very directive things I wanted to, to, to make comment of regarding you and a little bit of advice, and then I want to give you your choice. I'm going to give you three choices of what I might be able to speak about today. I grew up in Beaver. I announced myself as growing up in Beaver, all 2,000 of us if you count the cows. And uh, I'm proud of that. It taught me such great work ethic, and I'm very grateful for that experience. However, if you had told me at that point some of the opportunities that I would now have, uh, I would have told you to sprout wings and flap yourself to the moon. I grew up in a, a, a home where my father was blind. Uh, he lost his sight at the age of five years old. He was the county attorney. And quite frankly, he couldn't understand me. He never did get me. It wasn't, he's now 95 years old. We celebrated his 95th birthday this last, I just feel like I'm lost this half of the room. This is like terribly awkward. I don't know whether to go here or here, so I'm just going to go wherever. Uh, but my father, uh, 95, just turned 95 years old, and he was an attorney. A very intellectual, deeply intellectual man. And he had this crazy oldest son. It was a great opportunity being his son because uh, I got to be able to describe the world, to hold my father's arm as we walked around, to fix a lot of things. And it gave me a lot of opportunity, very young, to see the world very, very self-aware of all the things that may happen, including the trip points for my blind father. And I'd argue that was actually a key thing in helping me become a very good entrepreneur is recognizing the problems and all the obstacles and the layout of things coming at my blind father. But uh, my father was always confused by this son. Why was I always wanting to sell candles or sell night crawlers or, or start a lawn mowing business or whatever? It was like, son, can't you just like be an attorney or be an accountant or something sane? And uh, it caused, actually caused quite a bit of friction in our household to the point that I kind of mustered under the pressure. And when I went to university, I decided, OK, uh, there was one thing I didn't understand in high school. I was part of the radio announcing group. And I didn't understand how those darn electronics and all those tubes and radios work. And so I decided I was going to be an electrical engineer. So I got my undergraduate in electrical engineering. And I honestly, I, it wasn't my true passion and joy in the world, but I kind of did OK. But I would sneak over to this crazy little thing called the Entrepreneur Lecture Series at my university. Uh, and at that point, engineers and business guys did not communicate. It was kind of like, I don't know, you did not do it. If you were an engineer and you digressed, it was like, you're selling out, dude. And business guys, we were way too nerdy for uh, for the business guys. And so it did not blend. So I would sneak into the back of the class. I would purposely wait till I was about three minutes late. All my engineering friends didn't know where I was going. I would just magically disappear. And I'd sit in the back second from the left corner so I could be the first one out at the very end. I never dared ask one question. I just sat there and listened. And I loved it. It was like the inspiration that just like sung to my heart. I heard this guy, this crazy cool guy, that had just bought gas caps. He bought gas caps that locked. And he bought the world, the, the market supply out in the United States and created this cool little company. And his name was Larry H. Miller. <laughs> and I heard him lecture one of his first lectures. And so all these entrepreneurs, and I just couldn't kind of help myself. It was almost like a drug. I couldn't help myself but want to be an entrepreneur. My father would announce me, ah, oh, Brett, my son Brett, he went to that John Hopkins, he was a doctor, 
they went to the John Hopkins and was a doctor. Vaughn, he had followed the family tradition, he's a doctor. Daryl, he designs, he designs those big fancy temples. Richard, I don't know what he does. <laughs> And so it actually caused a lot of conflict until at one point I just embraced it. Just embraced it and realized, you know, I'm actually pretty good at doing this stuff. I've now founded or co-founded 51 companies. 19 have failed. 19 have failed, and I'm actually really proud of that. 17 have become multi-million dollars, but 19 have failed. And I'm going to share a couple of those little secrets with you today of how you can kind of disseminate that. I'll let you pick what we actually talk about. So uh, through the course of this journey and experience, I came out of Beaver, Utah. I set some crazy goals and never could have I had dreamed the amazing, incredible life that I would have now. As a nerd, a perfectly good engineering nerd that followed the dream of being an entrepreneurship, an entrepreneur. And in my day, entrepreneurs were not cool. We were crazy. And engineers were not cool. So the first advice that I'd like to give you, and maybe the only advice that I would give to you is this, number one, do not dream small. Put it out there. Put it out there. That's dream number one. Number two is be the very best version of your authentic self that you can be. I'm proud that I'm a nerd. You know what? I've got very comfortable with it. And if you like to play Pokemon, I'm with you. Pokemon level number 42 level right here. So... I don't care what it is. If, if, if you're into long boards and whatever else, if you, whatever you do, own it. Don't be a fake. Don't uh, di disingenuously fake your way through life. Own the very best version of yourself that you can be. And if you do it at your age, then great things will occur. I'm going to give you one other piece of advice, and then I'm going to take a little bit of vote of what we can talk about today to, to get optimal use of our time. Um, when I got married to my wife, I just, I, I've got a, I, my wife is just an amazing individual that I love very dearly. I fought like crazy to get her. And when uh, we got married, we had $500, a Dodge Colt that had been totaled three times, and we didn't even have an apartment to live in. Uh, our weekly food budget was $14 a week. But what we did do is, is, is we had a lot of big dreams, a lot of aspirations, and a lot of hope. And the, the, the confidence that my wife had in me exceeded the confidence I had myself. One of the things I did intuitively do is now I call it the value equation. And, and I'd like to teach that to you today of how you get your breaks, how you get ahead. One of the biggest questions asked to me is, Rich, how do you start a business with only $5,000? How do you do that? And my comment is, is most businesses have very, very little to do with money. I'm 100% positive that if we got together for one hour and collaborated, we could build a million dollar business out of nothing more than we have in this room. And we could look around right in this room when we could build a million dollar business uh, using this formula and this concept that I want to teach you. The concept is, is this. Intellect, well, no working. This is not going good. Can someone snag me a... Intellectual capital. That's your brains. You've got to be smart. You've got to be able to get some skills that you can actually use that have some value. If you're dumb as a box of rocks, it's going to be a really long, hard life. I'm sorry, but it's going to be really a long, hard life. That's the reason you're here at, the, uh, at Snow College, is, is to get intellectual capital. You have to use that intellectual capital in a positive way. And you serve the people in your life, the key relationships in your life. This is relationship capital. If you do that in the form of a business, which is the equal sign, then it equals money. It's really that simple. Most people think, hey, if I get really, really smart and I learn how to do stock trading or something, and then I use the minus sign and I figure fancy ways to take advantage of people and screw people over, then I'm going to make a lot of money. But it's actually very non-non-sustainable. Real value is created in long-term ways by getting smart, using the positive signs, serving the good people, in your life, doing it in the form of the business, you make a lot of money. And I want to uh, maybe just tell a story or two about this. In our family, we create businesses. Each of my five sons have created 
Well, my three oldest created a million dollar businesses when they were still in high school. And so we talked a lot about businesses uh, growing up. Our family was a nerdy family. We didn't talk baseball scores as much as we talked about creating businesses. I came home one day and my little uh, five-year-old son, Alex, said, Dad, I created a business today. I said, really? Tell me about that, son. He says, uh, I, I heard the neighbors over talking and they were complaining about dog poop. All the dog poop on the lawns. And uh, so I listened to that. So intellectual capital. He knew how to pick up dog poop. That's his intellectual capital. Plus, he went through the neighborhood, took a bucket. He says, my wife says, oh, you what? He says, no, no, mom, I use gloves. I got a glove. So he went through the whole neighborhood and picked up all the dog poop on all the neighborhood lawns. Then he posted a little teeny poster on each of the doors that says, Alex Pooper Scoopers, brought to you today by free. If you want to have this service every week, it's $5 a week. His first week, he signed 20 clients. He then got his friends involved. And uh, he had 40 clients by the end of the month. Do the math. That's, uh, what is it? Come on, someone help me. OK. That was the first, that was the first month. So my son, my five-year-old son's earning like $1,000 a month. <laughs> How did he do it? How much did it cost him? How much money did that cost him? Intellectual capital, he knew how to pick up poop. Plus sign, he served people. He genuinely served and saw a need. Relationship capital was the most influential people that he had. He did it in the form of the business and it equaled dollars. He didn't go and pick up the dog poop and throw it on people's doorsteps. That's using the minus sign. So it actually doesn't take a ton of money to actually make money. It takes genuine service to really good people to the right channel. My first break came uh, when I went, went to university, and we were, I shared that we were poor as street mice. And uh, I always worked really hard, and I got this job at this company called Netline. And I was just a very junior technician in that company. But I worked really, really hard, and I tried super, super hard. And there was this guy named Alan. Man, I just saw him, and I just, I so respected this guy. I mean, I just watched how he interacted and behaved. And then I, I heard that, hey, there's this really big shot coming in tomorrow to get funding. We're asking for $2 million to fund this company. And so I was the last one working. I made a habit of working really hard. And as I was going out, I said, whoa, there's the setup. But it's like, it looks like garbage. It's like, it looks terrible. The screens are dirty. The cords are not done. There's so I just took a few minutes. My wife had come. And so I, she vacuumed, and I cleaned up, cleaned the screens, and put the cords behind it. Didn't tell anybody. Uh, and the next day, Ray Norda, a guy named Ray Norda, the founder of Novella, came and did it. They did the presentation. They funded it. We got the $2 million. This guy named Alan Hall was a, a mid-level manager there. He found out that I had done that. I don't know how he found out, but he kind of figured out I was the one that had cleaned things up. And he instantly promoted me to be the guy that went around the United States with him, just simply setting up his technology. And uh, then based on the setup of the technology, he, he learned that I could actually say a few kind of funny things. And I was barely articulate. And so he started having me do part of the presentation. The company ended up failing, horribly failing. But in, the, in our travels, Alan kept talking about this thing called temp reps, this idea of temp reps. And so he shared it with me when the company felt he went off and did Temprex. And Brad knows who I'm talking about. I think he's come to lecture you with. My mentor was Alan Hall. My first huge break in life came from my intellectual capital of learning how to push a broom and clean a monitor. I did it in the form of service. I didn't have ulterior motives with it. I did it to the best in intellectual capital that I knew, which was uh, in relationship capital, which was Alan Hall, and it served me very, very, very well through my life. Those of you who don't know, Alan, Alan Hall is one of the very, he's one of our regents now. He's been a crazy successful individual. That company went on to become a multi-billion dollar company called Market Star. Intellectual capital plus relationship capital equals financial capital. If I could share one thing of you from a kid coming from a rural community, use the plus sign. Use the plus sign, don't use the minus sign. And look for opportunities of how can I contribute. 
Always look for ways you can contribute. If you see your teacher struggling with something, do it. I so appreciate you going and getting me Marcus. You just use the plus sign. So always look for ways to contribute and be the one to step forward. And you will never lack for job opportunities. You'll never lack for, you'll never lack for resources. You'll never lack for friends. Please, I beg you, use the plus sign in your life. This formula is, is the best thing that I can give you to tell you how to succeed. All right. I'm, I've got till 1.30. Or 120, right? So I got 30 minutes. You guys are really a dead crowd. Either got to say something more interesting or wake you up or something. So I'm going to give you three choices. Um, there's three things that we can do. Number one is, as I can talk about, how to determine if you have good ideas or bad ideas. We can talk about that. Uh, and I'm going to let you guys all vote here in a minute. For choice number one is to talk about how do you know if you have a good idea or a bad idea and how to generate ideas. Number two, we can talk about the model that I, I use called zigzag principle, which is, is the model of how you get to success and how you can fail really efficiently. Or model number three, you guys can just ask questions. All right, so everybody who would like to do number one, again, number one is, is talk about good ideas, bad ideas. Raise your hand. Okay, everyone who wants to talk about zigzag and modeling to get to success, raise your hand. And anyone who wants to just ask questions, raise your hand. All right, no questions to ask. We're going to talk about good ideas, bad ideas. Uh, ideas are really easy. They're also really, really useless. Ideas, I break into four categories the type of individuals and the stages of business. The first is idea people. We've all met people who have great, great ideas. Very seldom is that worth much, honestly. And ideas, the question is, is there's a lot of ideas out there about how do you determine if it's a good idea or a stupid idea. And I've got four tools, maybe five tools, that I always use when I vet through before I start in a business to determine if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Second phase, and this is the hard part where entrepreneurship really happens, and that is, that is, is the, the rainmaker. It's coming in, it's breathing it to life. It's taking straw and weaving it into gold. That's the hard part, and actually what I would encourage you to be. That's the rainmakers. That's where it happens. I, I, I'm in that phase, too. Number three is taking what's working, expanding it, and uh, making it more efficient. That's getting all the gears, replacing the duct tape and the belling wire, putting the gears in place, and really getting going efficient. Also great value added there. Phase four is protecting it. That's where attorneys and uh, uh, accountants and hardcore people don't mess up the business. So I think it's really important that you identify and understand what phase of individual you best attribute to, and then naturally gravitate there. But I will make the comment that most people think uh, uh, an idea is all the value. It actually isn't. It's deploying it where the real value is created. So what I'll do is, is, is I'll just quickly spend a quick... First of all, when I, before I ever build a business, I probably go through about 50 ideas. I don't just take the first idea and run at it. I'll get a whole bunch of ideas, and I'll run it through a couple of these tools to validate how the, the potential likelihood of the business succeeding. And I've got actually so that I'm pretty good and pretty accurate at it, I'm going to run... Um, Let's see, I'm going to do, I'll do two tools, and then I'll give one of you a chance, and we'll run it through the tools really quickly with you. Okay, so the first model, let's see, which am I going to do? I'm going to do modified Michael E. Porter model. Uh, does anybody know what the Porter model is? Does it, have anyone heard of the Porter model? Okay. Can everyone see over here? Okay, this is Michael E. Porter. It's called the Five Forces model. Michael E. Porter is a Harvard professor, and good luck. This is Beaver version of it. Simple to understand, really quick. And, and there's not a, there's not a day that goes by that at least five people. I'll probably have 40 tonight because I got a bunch of my young single adults coming over for idea and go through it. But most days I hear up to five or six ideas, and this is the first tool that I run to. I just crank, crank, crank through my head really quickly, and then give pluses or minuses to determine how viable. So this is the simplified version of Michael Porter, and. At any point, stop me if something doesn't make sense here. OK, so the first one is, is how intense is the competition? How intense is the competition? Uh, the next one over here is, is the power of the buyers. Do they have power, or do I have the power? How about suppliers? 
oh, it's the power of the suppliers. The next one is the substitutes. Substitutes is the bottom one. And then the great big important one in the middle is barriers to entry. What are the barriers to entry? And the last one is channel. And I pulled channel out. This is a rich ad because I think it's so important. Of my 19 failures, there's only been one failure that did not fail because of channels. My number one rule, I will not do a business if I don't have the channel figured out first. That means I very seldom develop the product first. So let's quickly talk about what these mean, and then I'll run a quick example. Uh, OK, intensity of competition. That's simply, is this like slugfest? Coca-Cola and Pepsi hate each other to the point. I, I had a meeting one time with Coke, and we had Pepsi in the room. The Coke people refused to even step in the room until we'd removed the Pepsi. That's intense competition. What point you're spending billions of dollars on, uh, on ads, that's intense competition. Uh, insurance agents in town, they lightly spar, but it's not super intense competition. The harder and the more intense the competition, the more brutal the bloodbath is, and you don't want to enter that market. So based on it, I'll either give it a plus, a minus, or a neutral. OK, the next one down here will go to substitutes. Uh, how many alternates are there for this product that you're coming up with? If there's a thousand and one alternates, and not, it's, it's just really hard. Again, it's a bloodbath. So positive, negative, or positive, neutral, or minus. The buyers. Do I have powers to increase the price with buyers? Can I pretty much dictate my price, or is it really, really super price sensitive? Gasoline, super price sensitive. You increase it three, they drive. Two or three cents, they drive to the next gas station. So that's an example of really a poor price sensitivity. Suppliers, do I have the ability to go and negotiate a better price with the suppliers? That's the, that's the supplier one. Then barriers to entry is what can I do that can keep other people from entering? Typical barriers to entry, can I file a patent? Am I the first one to the market? Do I own the brand? Can I actually control the brand? Is it a huge financial investment, or do I have some intellectual capital skill that nobody else has? And then part of barriers to entry is, is also channel, but I always pull that out. Now, when I say channel, does everyone know what that means, or you want me to go into it? Okay. Ch channel means how do I get it to market? Do I have the ability to control it and get it to market? So. Um, do I actually have an ability to actually take and sell this right into the market right now? Uh, in the, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll run an example. We're going to run a really positive example and a really negative example here through the model, and then I'll let you pick one of yours. OK, we're going to go into creating soda pop. I got a great idea, Rich. We're going we're gonna to make soda pop. We've got this new great water that's in Snow College, and we, we pour a little bit of lemonade in with the Coke, and it creates a magic zip, zip, fizz, fizz. Everybody really loves it. Great idea, right? OK. How intense is the competition in soda pop market? Crazy intense. How many substitutes are there for Snow, Col uh, Snow College's new zippy uh, flavored lemonade Coke water? <laughs> soda. Huh. How many flavors of soda? How many brands of soda? Juice, milk, water, power water, Gatorade. It's terrible. How, in, how much power do I have over the buyer? Can I sell our new little soda pop for an extra 50 cents? How about an extra nickel? How about an extra three cents? Probably not. I probably got to give it away to get it started. So that's a minus. Can I go and nego negotiate a better price for sugar? Seriously, can I, can I negotiate a better price than sugar than Coca-Cola? No. OK, you're getting the idea. This probably isn't a very good idea, right? <laughs> How about barriers to entry? How hard is it to create soda pop? It's called put it in your kitchen sink, put a little sugar in, stir it up, and uh, how many children have lemonade stands? Not a lot of barriers to entry, right? <laughs> then the big pull out, the channel. Does anybody in here have ability to sell into a national distribution channel and to get our new soda water into the market? Now, if your brother-in-law happened to be the uh, if your brother-in-law happened to be the head person in charge of distribution for Walmart, 
and guaranteed it was a lock, then you would have that and you'd put a plus. Otherwise, you've got to put a minus. As I'm running this model, my number one rule is if I don't got that one figured out, stop, do not go forward, do not do anything until I got the channel locked down. Okay, so should we ever build this business? One, two, three, four. No, please don't build that business. <laughs> Bad idea. Have I ever built that business? Have I ever done this? Come on, guys, interact with me. Give me some bright eyes. Give me a guess. No. Yes. I have. Under what exception would I ever build this business? Why would I ever build this business? My wife owns a piece of real estate on the very corner of Provo, where the whole 24th of July or the 4th of July parade parades down. And if my, ch if my sons will set up their little pop stand and sell flavors of pop and water on the 20. Oh, no, on the 4th of July, for one day, they control what? What do they control? Of all of these. I have a great, big, huge, fat, juicy plus right there that they can kill it because they control the channel. And they can charge double. So there's times that you actually do it. Does this mean we would never do this business? No. What does it mean when you get a couple or a bunch of minuses? It means that you have to pay much more attention to transactional costs. You have to pay much, much more attention to transactional costs, which means you have to be really, 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 really efficient and do it more efficiently than anyone else. So there's people that make millions and millions of hundreds of millions of dollars doing this, but they have to be super, super efficient. As a bootstrapper, I choose not to do that. Let's push an example now in the other extreme, and then we'll run one more model, and then I want to run, teach you one other funner, little simpler tool. OK. We are now going to become Google. We are Google, all right? Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun to be Google? OK, here's Google. How intense is the competition with Google? I created the algorithm. I'm Sergey. Hi. <laughs> How intense is the competition with Google? Come on. It's intense? It's a monopoly. Bing. Who should, who, everyone who uses Bing as their search engine, raise your hand. <laughs> OK, we got one. I got so ticked off at Google one time because they held $100,000 back from me. I used Bing for three weeks. And then I went back to Google. So we got a big juicy plus there. How many substitutes are there for Google? Oh, you got some. Yeah, you got a few. You got the encyclopedia. Who's used encyclopedia this week? <laughs> we got a plus. OK. How much power do we have, based on this, how much power do they have over the buyers? Because they make most of their money out of Google AdWords. And people click those ads most of the time without knowing what they are. Oh, it's a double plus. <laughs> I don't give double pluses very often. How about the suppliers? Their cost is zero because it's vapor, first of all, so they control it. Those of us that do try selling to them, it's the only contract I've ever signed in my entire life that said, trust us. I used to be a supplier. A couple of my businesses were doing Google uh, arbitrage and doing Google advertising. It's the only contract I've ever signed in my entire life that it said, we'll pay you what we feel like paying you. And if we don't feel like paying you, we won't pay you and we won't tell you what percentage we're going to pay you. Trust us. We do no evil. <laughs> Is that power? Plus, plus. Bearish entry. Who knows how to create uh, the new penga, penguin and panda algorithm? How many billions of dollars are invested into their servers? Who has a chance to ever duplicate that model now and to get control of it? There may be something at some point, but it's going to have to be major, major disruptive in the form of something that zones into our brains and goes zzzz and spits something out. But right now, barriers to entry, patents, servers, technology, investment, first mover, brand. And I never do that, but that gives you an idea of how crazy it is to overcome that. Now, the big one, because I won't do it, even if, even if this was true, if I couldn't control the channel. So 
me trying to enter into this market, it's all negative. Do you see that? It would be all negative. But Google control me. They are the channel. They are literally the very headwaters of every channel in the world. 95% of all business ideas that I hear when I say, oh, how are you going to get that to market, which is basically what's your channel, the response is, is, oh, I'll use online marketing. What does that mean, online marketing? Okay, well, uh, what online marketing do you use? Well, I'll use Facebook ads, and I'm going to advertise on Google. Google is the channel, so they big time have that covered. Is there any wonder why Google is so crazy viable? And I push that to an extreme example, and most examples that we do in business idea, you may come up with two or three. Does it mean don't do it if you have a couple of nights? No, 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 absolutely, it's okay to do it, unless it's the channel. Never go forward unless you have the channel locked down. But even if you have a couple of negatives, it's actually okay to go. You just need to be aware that it's not going to be quite as lucrative. The more pluses you get in the model, the more pluses you get, the higher probability and the higher margins you're going to get, higher probability of success. And you can do it real time, ba 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 like that. And in three minutes, I can, I, I can guess 95% of the time if the business is viable or not. Michael E. Porter, Richards, Beaver, simplified, dummy down a model. Any questions on that model? Make sense to everyone? Okay, I'm going to do one more really quickly and then we can run a couple of examples. Okay, this one I call, where do you fish? Okay, this axis here is, is felt need. How strong is the felt need? This is the size of the market. Low and high. Uh, so this, let's do an example of this. We're going to come up with new Expo magic markers. We're going to do Snow College Expo green, only green magic markers, and we're going to sell them all across campus. How strong is the felt need on that? Anyone really excited? Is that really saving, solving world hunger? Low, low felt need. What's the size of the market? Can everybody see that okay? Okay, I call that a mud puddle. You do not catch fish in mud puddles. Don't fish in mud puddles. Okay? Now we're going to create expo markers, magic markers, that are in the color of every university in the United States. We're going to have SUU with the bright red. Here we got Weber State. We're going to brand it. Here we're going to put a nice little Weber State on this one. We're going to put a Thunderbird on this one. We're going to put your logo here. We're going to make them really nice, and we're going to sell them all over. How strong is the felt need on that? Is that keeping you awake at night? You don't have your uh, Thunderbird mask at Expo marker? Okay, so the felt need's pretty small, right? Uh, the size of the market's pretty big though, right? So what that is, is that's a swamp. You can catch fish there, but it's catfish and carp, and they're not very tasty. Th this are the products that are stuffed full in dollar stores. If you go to a dollar store, that's all you're buying is this swamp kind of stuff. So don't, don't fish in swamps. So what everybody wants to do then is great, 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 great. So what I really want to do is I want to go something with a super, super strong felt need and a really big market, right? Is that where we should play? Everyone who thinks that that's the place to play, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Come on. So do it like you mean. Own your decisions here. Okay. That is not where you should play. <laughs> okay. That is not where I play. What's examples of that? Uh, weight loss. Weight loss is a great example of that. Um, every woman that I've ever met in my life is trying to lose five or 10 pounds, ever. And so that's a big market. The felt needs like a seven. That's the ocean. Has anyone fished in the ocean? Someone who's fished in the ocean. How many fish did you catch? One, okay, how long did you fish? Okay, two hours. Anyone else fish? How'd you do? One fish. You were out there for four hours. Uh, there's a lot of water for a very few fishes. Now, when you catch them, you really, really catch them. And I've been three times. The first two times, I fed the fish. All I did was vomit. <laughs> uh, didn't catch any fish. The third time, they said, we're slaying them. We're slaying them today. Slaying them. <laughs> we caught four fish. <laughs> They were salmon, they were really nice, but I don't call that slaying it. 
So if you're going to fish in the ocean, it's a great, great place actually to play longer term, but you have to have huge, huge, huge marketing dollars to play there. So I encourage any of you doing a business, please do not fish in the ocean. Don't be tempted to go hit a big market with the strong felt need. Where I like to fish, everything that I do is in the fish hatchery. Small, tight, constrained market, really strong felt need. My mother-in-law, a very eccentric, fun, little 85-year-old grandma, and she's always, uh, uh, she's always manipulating me. And about a year ago, she came to me and says, Rich, there's two things in my life that I have not done that I would really like to do. Will you help me? I mean, I already know, oh boy, this is going to be really tough. I take a gulp and says, well, Grandma, it depends on what it is. What is it? The first is, I'd like to hike the Zion Narrows. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, sorry, Grandma. That's going to have to wait till the next life because I'm not taking you through the Zion Narrows. After she'd finished pouting, she says, I'm 85 years old. I've never caught a fish. Will you help me catch a fish? And I says, Grandma, that I can do. So I took her down to my cabin and waited until a great big reservoir that's right kind of near my cabin drains. And then there's this little stream about this big that comes out of that little, that little, that big lake. And uh, I took her down there after uh, those fish were just freaking starving and put her on the bank. 500 fish jumped to try catching the night crawler. The only time we didn't catch a fish was when the other fish knocked the hook over and like in an hour later we have 32 fish. I said, Grandma, I hope there's no fish and game wardens around here. He says, they're not going to send the 85 year old to prison. He says, no, but they will send me to prison. And so I made her stop. That's how I like to fish. So what does that look like in the form of business? If we could create a product that addressed, let's see, let me make something up that's relevant here. If we could create a product that helped children who had cancer be able to not vomit and get sick and make them feel a lot better and have their appetite increase and have them have a more joyful day or two in Utah, what did I just do? How strong is the felt need? For a parent, are you kidding me? Little Johnny not throwing up in the cancer treatment. How size is the market? That's a fish hatchery. And I think intuitively you can see that that product is going to be very viable. The question is, you can do that. I understand there was, I don't know if we have the creators of this product here, but there was a, a product created out of this university that I'm very aware of. It was a hay feeder that came out of the university, right? Yeah. Okay, why did that work? What's the size of the market there? Small. Small? Is that good or bad? Most people, oh, I'm sorry, it's a small market. Oh, say, great, bring it on. What is it? Because you can get to it. You can get to those individuals. So you've instantly got people who are feeding cows. Then you solved a very strong felt need. Name, spit off. You, you nodded yes. What was the felt need that solved? I think it was mobile too. It made it, and it actually was much more dullable. Yeah. Was it now? Is is that solving? Is that solving cancer for young kids? No. But is it uh, an expo pen? So you got to say no. It's about right there. Then the trick becomes once you say okay, I'm in the right quadrant, is how do I increase and amplify that felt need? What verbs and what wordage could I use to actually amplify the felt need and make it even more desirable? That's a whole other discussion. I could take probably two hours on you that. It's called surprising broker. Matter of fact, maybe I'll, I'm going to spend one minute on that and then I'm going to open up because how long do we got? We only got ten, five, seven minutes left? Eight. Eight minutes. Okay, I'm going to do this really quickly. Everyone touch the left temple of your brain. Left of your brain, that's called the broca region. That broca region right there is the thing that determines absolutely everything that gets into your frontal cortex, the processing portion of your brain. Who saw any bulletin boards coming to school today or any advertising messages? Do you remember what it was, Brad? Yeah, we were recruiting for the eSports team. Okay, eSports team. Uh, how many did you see, though? How many, how many visible were there? Two. Okay. 
I bet you each one of you today saw at least 500 marketing messages and none of it got through. Why? Because Broca, all Broca does is sit there and say, is it fresh, is it relevant, is it fresh, is it relevant, is it fresh, is it relevant? Because if it gets to your frontal cortex, it's like the turbo button on your video game. It just like uses all your life and energy up and so it very carefully, Broca very carefully says what's new, what's relevant. And so you have to very, very carefully put words in there or give events that cause it to break through. As I was driving over from Provo today, if a purple elephant had went blup, 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 right in the middle of the road, then I would have said, whoa, Brad, you wouldn't believe what I saw today, right? That's because it got through Broca. So it's really important as you're doing marketing messages and attempting to get to market, you plot purple elephants that are relevant and really fresh. How do we do that in the case of this cow hay feeder? If you go, I wish the guys were here, because actually I'd charge them $10,000 for this advice. Uh, stop killing your cows. It's, it's, it's actually passing ionized barbed wire to all your users. And you can actually make double the value of your cows and so much more feeding. Do you realize that you're losing 20% of your hay efficiency by by uh, using conventional hay feeders. See, I instantly just got through Broca and got a processing and thinking to make decisions. So the trick when you find something that's in the fish hatchery, barely, don't give up on it. Just amplify the felt need and modify the product until you get deeper in the fish hatchery. If I wanted to even amplify that one, I could create a product that children that are cancer that had been abandoned by their children that had been abused. And see how I just amplified that even? I tightened the market even more. So small markets are not bad because you can get to them. So that's the second model. Anyone have any questions on that? We've got exactly five minutes left, and so I'm going to take the time now to open up and answer any questions that you have. Yes? Have you ever chosen a business and not, and not have the channel ready? Yeah. How, how did that go? Was this not good. I've never succeeded. Even the ones that failed, even the ones that have failed, I mean, a lot of, yeah, every, I, there has not been one failed business that it hasn't failed, except for one. I had one business that had a value misalignment. We turned it into a million dollar business, but the, my partner was just nuts and didn't value align, so I killed it. But other than that, every time I failed, it's because of the channel. If there's one piece of advice I keep on my desk, if any of you ever come visit me, you'll see on my desk my first $2 million mistake where I built the coolest technology on God's good green little earth and then proceeded to fail the business. It cost me $2 million because I built it and then tried selling it. Sell it, figure out how to get it to market, then build it. Richie, you know, when you go through an analysis like this, it's not likely you're going to have pluses across the board. No. And it seems like you're saying that there's, there's some that you have to have channel being one of them. So would you sort of, like, there's a certain way it seems, like a, uh, that the channel's got to be there. Yeah. But there'd be certain maybe situations where you would choose to go ahead. And Absolutely. Go. And you can run 40, 50. You run 15, 20, 30, 40 ideas. Someone throw me an idea real quickly, and with your permission, I'll out you. Someone throw me an idea real quickly. I'll show you how quickly I do this. Uh, oh, a washing machine that loads your clothes into a dryer automatically. Okay, washing machine that automatically loads into a dryer. Do I have permission to be honest? Because yes. most of the time I've learned just I sit there, good luck with that because I don't have the hour and a half explanation and the energy to fight someone. So do I have permission to be honest yeah. on that idea? Okay, so we have a washing machine that somehow manually loads it. How intense is the competition in washers and dryers? And it's kind of commoditized, they're all over the place. So, well, first of all, we'll go here. How, how big is the market on that? Um, mm, it's pretty big. It's kind of like probably about right in here. Loading, how strong is the felt need of someone having to move the thing in? It's like right in there for me. It has to be stronger for me. So already I'm like, ugh. The felt need of someone taking and throwing it in, I don't know. It's kind of there, kind of not. How much, how much could I, how much power and leverage could I increase the buyers? I actually think that's a plus. I actually think I could charge 100 extra bucks or 150 extra bucks on the high end of the market. Uh, do I have power to negotiate better price for new mechanics, for new washer machines? I don't. How intense is the competition in washer and dryers? LG, Whirlpool, 
some pretty big names in there. How many substitutes are there? There's hanging on. No, not bad. Not bad. There's, there's not a lot of substitutes to it. Now, Barrister Antry, do you have the patent filed on it? Do you have the patent? Do you have a trademark? Have you released the product yet? Do you have the million dollars uh, for funding to do the prototype? Do you have a brother-in-law that has the ability to sell into all the local appliance stores? Do you? If you do, I'd say, seriously, get after these other and switch them. If you don't, don't go forward until you figure out the channel. Take the concept, lock it down, go file a patent. Go get a patent filed on. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to cost you a couple of thousand dollars and don't worth it. So there's my analysis on that idea. Uh, two plus, a potential couple of others, but we gave him a four minus two plus. Right now, don't do that business. If you do do it, then what can you do to flip those to pluses? Very seldom are you going to get a Google. Every time I've got a five star, I've killed it. I've killed it. But they don't come along very often. To your point, very seldom do you actually get five stars. Okay, I think I've killed the time. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Yeah.